Welcome to Unit 5 for Bio 102, uh, Human Impacts on Water, Air, and Land. So uh, this unit's going to be about a lot of different forms of pollution. It's going to be about municipal waste, solid waste that comes from human societies and how it's dealt with. Um, we're going to talk about electronics recycling. You can see here, this is a large field, kind of a dump, where old electronics are shipped from highly developed countries into less developed countries uh, and the garbage just kind of piles up sometimes it is um, the components are taken out to refine metals and uh, other materials that are in there and they have much lower safety regulations in these countries so the workers are uh, being paid very very little to deal with this hazardous waste they're breathing in nasty fumes it's destroying their ecosystems but in Away, this is how we export uh, some of our environmental problems. So land is going to be part of this, how uh, solid waste and other forms of waste affect the land. Air quality, we're going to talk about the ways in which uh, some pollutions uh, have adverse health effects, so they can cause uh, lung diseases and other kinds of health complications uh, just by existing. We'll talk a little bit about the ozone layer, we'll talk about acid rain, and we're going to talk about climate change because that is a uh, air pollution adjacent problem. And of course, uh, any pollutants that are in the air also work their way into the water column. Any thing that's dumped on land is going to find its way through watersheds into the water. Uh, so we're going to talk about water pollution as well and some of the specific issues there. Now the first thing to know about water pollution is that there's actually not a lot of fresh water on Earth. 75% uh, of the Earth's surface is covered in water, right? Everyone knows that. We learned that fact when we we're in elementary school. It's mostly ocean, though. It's all salt water, and we can't drink salt water. We don't use that for industry. Um, the, the salt and materials are kind of, uh, will corrode parts and gunk up mechanisms. So we tend to use fresh water for agricultural purposes, right? For uh, crop irrigation, they need fresh water, not salt water to drink. For uh, human uh, societies, not only for drinking water, but for bathing, for uh watering your lawns, golf courses, water parks. Uh, we use water for all kinds of things. For any kind of product, say you're making Coca-Cola or, or these days just bottling water altogether, right? Uh, any kind of process we use fresh water for. Uh, and that is a much smaller piece of the total supply of water on Earth. So annually, 34% of the world's runoff is used. Uh, and of that runoff, and that's just precipitation that hits the ground, right? That's runoff. 70% uh, goes to agriculture, so that is the big consumer of water. 20% goes to industry. 10% goes to residential. Um, now, you might be familiar with some ideas of environmentalism that have historically been advertised as like this is how we're going to save the planet like taking shorter showers and turning the faucet off while you're brushing your teeth things like that and those help right those personal choices reducing your own consumption absolutely helps but if you take a look at this uh, breakdown of how the world's water is utilized 70 percent through agriculture 20 percent through industry it's more in the products that we use and how those uh, the, that water is applied to produce those products that actually affects our water. 10% residential, that's all drinking water, all bathing water, toilets, uh, washing clothes, all of that. So if we were able to use our agricultural water more intelligently, if we were to use better irrigation methods or uh, drought tolerant crops, things like that, we would actually extend our water supply a good deal more than any of the uh, kind of small scale personal choices that we can make. Uh, so that's one consideration. Over 30 countries experience stress from water scarcity, expected to increase to about 60 countries uh, within the next uh, uh, couple of decades here by 2050. So how little water is there? Well, only about 3% of the world's water is actually safe for drinking. It's fresh water. Uh, 97, uh, the other 97% of water is salt water. Now, of that 3%, of that 3%, 97% of it is not accessible. It's frozen in glaciers or uh, as uh, frozen water in, in um, 
Antarctica, things like that. Uh, it, it's totally solid and we're not using it and just serving a really important role in mitigating uh, climate disaster. So we, we don't want to lose that frozen water in glaciers, but it does mean that only 3% of 3% of the world's water supply is available as fresh water, as surface runoff, um, as lakes and rivers, uh, as precipitation, as groundwater. In total, we're talking about 0.1% of all water is available as liquid fresh water that can actually be utilized. 3% uh, of 3% rounded up is 0.1%. Now from unit three, you know that the human population is growing, uh, and the more people we have, the more water we require, not just for drinking, but for crops and, and all the other functions uh, of industry and society. Uh, and as countries move through the human development index, uh, as they continue through that demographic transition, becoming a more and more highly developed, the average per capita water consumption also increases. But the fresh water supply has not increased. It's the same amount. In fact, it's decreased because of habitat destruction and, and climate change and all these kinds of things. Uh, in the United States, we have abundant water resources most places, but there are several states that are experiencing historic droughts, and that causes wildfires for one thing. It also decreases crop production. Uh, so we create these large engineering projects to try to deliver water to some of those states. Uh, so we'll, we can talk about that a little bit later. But in other countries where water conditions are even more uh, strained, you might have something like this. Take a look at this river. This is called the Brahmaputra River, and it runs through China, and then it goes through India. Part of the river moves through Bhutan, and then finally comes through to Bangladesh. Now, when you have a river that goes around borders like this, and obviously these are not the whole countries, this is just a section of the, um, the river basin, the watershed for this river. If you have a river that goes through several borders like this, it incentivizes the countries that are upstream, the ones that are upriver, to utilize as much of that water as possible, because once it leaves their territory, that they can't use that water anymore. So uh, you might see these orange triangles here, uh, these reddish uh, triangles, those are dams that have been built for China. So they're using it for drinking water reservoirs, they're using it for hydroelectric energy, and every dam is gonna slow down the flow of water going to the, all these other countries. And you know, countries, as I've mentioned, need water in order to support themselves, in order to support society and industry and give people drinking water. As a result, uh, Competition for fresh water can be pretty intense. This can be a politically divisive issue, something that uh, people will, will fight about. So let's talk about the nature of water scarcity. Let's put some numbers on it. Today, about 900 million people do not have access to safe drinking water, and global consumption of water doubles every 20 years. That is due to the human population growing, but also our lifestyle inflation, right? We demand more and more and more water for all of the various um, amenities that we uh, provide. The scarcity of water limits food production, and that raises food prices, and raising food prices widens the poverty gap. Um, if you do not have a lot of money, the grocery bill is a significant portion of your income. Uh, and therefore, increasing food prices disproportionately affects uh, the poorest people in society. Um, people who are wealthy, if they want to manage their food budget, they can buy less expensive foods, right? They, they, can, they can afford the really expensive foods, but if the budget goes too high, then they can just uh, pare down what they're eating. People who are at the bottom rungs of society, who don't have much money, they're already buying the cheapest foods possible. They're, they're getting what they can with their money. So if the food price goes up, they have really no option but to uh, eat less food. So that's a problem. This can be exacerbated by conflict, uh, fighting over the water sources, but also um, uh, 
uh, more violent conflicts like like war uh, it's hard to maintain your water delivery systems your agricultural systems irrigation your water reservoirs uh, if you are under siege if, if there's explosions going through uh, unsustainable resource use if we are using more water than strictly is required so again talking about um, irrigation methods and uh, creating products that are actually necessary as opposed to ones that uh, use water and are totally unneeded, and population growth. The issue of scarcity makes water pollution even more dire because, now think about it, we have this very tiny pool of water that all humans and all ecosystems are sharing. If that pool of water gets polluted, becomes unsafe to drink, we don't have a lot of options to look for other water sources. So here uh, you can see uh, this, is, this is a child in a less developed country uh, and he's pulling water from this puddle on the side of the road. And you can see how, how murky that water is. It definitely has sediments in there. There's definitely bacteria in there. Uh, it is not what we'd consider safe drinking water, but uh, little collections like this might be the only place where water is easily available because the groundwater has been tapped and there hasn't been a lot of rain lately. So what are some possible solutions uh, to water scarcity? We can do something in, in terms of agricultural production. Remember, 70% of water used is agricultural production. So we could use something called drip irrigation. This doesn't work for all crops, uh, but basically the idea is to run um, hoses uh, or flexible pipes underneath the soil and, uh, and sometimes on top of the soil. And what those hoses do is they have little perforations in them. So as the water is being run through, they just kind of slowly leak water over time. Uh, the normal way that we irrigate crops is to spray over the top of them. It kind of gets all over the leaves and most of that water just evaporates away. But if we are delivering water directly to the roots, we can actually use substantially less water and there's less of a risk of it just evaporating away. So you can get the same amount of irrigation, but it's being delivered more directly. That's drip irrigation. Uh, water conservation means using less water. Uh, you guys may be familiar with the three R's of uh, sustainable practices, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, reusing and recycling is well and good, uh, but it is reduce, reduce, reduce. That is the absolutely best thing you can do uh, to make your lifestyle more sustainable. So water conservation is about consuming less and maybe raising prices on those uh, products that require a lot of water uh, and are not strictly necessary. Uh, purification, uh, think about that kid getting the water out of the murky puddle. There are ways that we can purify that water. Uh, if you put a iodine or a chlorine tablet into the water, it will kill off a lot of the bacteria and nasty microbes that might be floating around in there. That's good. Uh, there might still be some chemicals in that water, some runoff from other sources that are going to be unhealthy uh, to drink. So we also have uh, methods of filtering the water. Uh, there's a product called a life straw, which can filter uh, hundreds of gallons uh, for about a $20 uh, item. And it's basically a personal use microfiltration system that can screen out a lot of the nasty toxins and also uh, the bacteria and, and things that would be inside of that water. Applying those kind of small scale things, distributing those sort of small scale filters might be one way we could increase access to water in areas that just don't have um, abundant water resources. So we'll talk about purification on both large scale and small scale a little bit later. Water recycling is the process of taking water that's already been used for one purpose and then using it again. So for instance, uh, the water that drains out of your dishwasher, right? You, you just used it to wash all your dishes. There's no reason why that has to be returned directly to the source. 
couldn't we use that water for um, for toilets, for example? Imagine a system that takes the water from, or even your clothes washer, uh, the, the water from your clothes washer, and then uses that to pump into your toilets instead of fresh water directly from the source. You could get multiple uses out of one set of water because not all water that we use in our homes or our businesses needs to be drinking water. It doesn't need to be pure, fresh water. Uh, there are some processes where a, a slightly lower water quality would be just fine. So that's part of the idea of water recycling, is being able to use one amount of water for multiple purposes before we uh, let it go down the drains. Rainwater harvesting. This is popular in some states that are more uh, scarce in water, that, that are more parched. Uh, this involves uh, hooking up your, the gutters that capture the water from your roof to a large barrel, usually like a 50 gallon drum or something like that. And then whenever it rains, uh, all of the water that hits your roof gets collected into that rain barrel. Uh, ordinarily, again, this water would just kind of spread all over the place and evaporate away, but we can capture it and utilize it. And then uh, you can use that to water your garden or use it for um, water purposes that don't require, again, drinking water quality, so for toilets and dishwashers and things uh, along that line. Typically, these systems also have a kind of filter built into them, so it's not just pure rainwater and roof runoff that's that's going into these systems. We have one of these set up at my house, uh, and the water is entirely used for our garden uh, outside, so we don't need to use city water in order to water the garden. Some states actually uh, have passed laws that makes rain barrels illegal. Um, the idea is that you are uh, that this is water that would have at least partially made its way through the watershed to um, public water sources. So if you're not paying for the water that came th from your roof, uh, that would have at least partially gone downstream. Like I said, a lot of it would not, but partially would have gone downstream in order to refill those public water sources that you're effectively stealing water uh, from the city by harvesting it from your roof. And while I understand the notion behind those laws, they do seem kind of silly. But maybe that's just my bias. I would have to look at some scientific research to determine if those kind of laws have a positive effect on the drinking water supply. The last one listed here is desalination. Desalination. To desalinate is to remove salt from water. This is the holy grail of uh, combating water scarcity. We have ways that we can convert salt water into fresh water and then supply that to locations that are water parched, that need a water supply. Um, the problem is that every desalination technique requires a lot of energy. Uh, and if it requires a lot of energy, it's very expensive, therefore, to utilize. So think about all that energy production we were talking about in Unit 4. All of those require infrastructure to be built. All of those require overhead costs. So the energy required for desalination is, is pretty big. It's pretty outsized. So desalinated water uh, is a little bit more expensive. Uh, there's a number of different ways you can desalinate water. Uh, the oldest method, right, and this used to be used by Greek sailors right, uh, in thousands of years ago, uh, is to boil water capture the steam, and then let that steam condense back down into a liquid. The salt will be left behind in whatever you're using to boil the water. Only the fresh water, the, the actual H2O, will be what uh, boils off. So you can capture that and then turn it into water. But anytime you are heating water, that again is going to require a lot of energy, gobs and gobs of energy, because water is slow to boil. That's one of its defining characteristics. It doesn't like changing its temperature very quickly. Uh, there's also a system, and I'll show you videos later on, where you can force water under high pressure through a uh, ultra tiny filter. A, and the pores in that filter are so small that only the H2O molecules can work their way through and all of the sodium and chlorine and all the other salts and materials inside that ocean water is caught in the filter. But the amount of force with which you need uh, to, 
to make the water go through this uh, filtration system, the amount of pressure you need to apply is a lot. So again, it requires a lot of energy to do this. If I'm going to tell you how to become an overnight billionaire right now, if you can design a desalination system that does not require as much energy as the other desalination systems that we have, that is uh, much more economical, you, I guarantee everyone will be interested in buying that technology. This would, that would overnight solve, well, it would take a while to build, but over a very short course of time, if we could use the 97% of water on earth that is salt water as drinking water and for industry, that would be a huge boon to human societies and ecosystems because we wouldn't need as much uh, competition for their water sources. So you can see on this map, uh, this is kind of water scarcity across the world. You can see areas where there's plenty of water, abundant water. South America, abundant water. Europe, abundant water. Uh, most of uh, Canada and North America and the uh, United States, abundant water. But even within the United States, you can see there's 17 Western states uh, that are experiencing historic droughts. Uh, and this is where you see wildfires increasing in those locations. So that's one big uh, concern for the United States. And then you see other countries that have even worse water scarcity. So the entire middle section uh, of Africa, it's been colored yellow and that's uh, uh, listed as economic water scarcity. That means that there's water available, but uh, it's very expensive to get that water. And some of these areas in uh, the Middle East and in Africa use those desalination plants in order to supplement their water supply. So if there's not enough reliable surface runoff, rivers and, and lakes and things like that being filled by precipitation, we're going to look to the groundwater to uh, increase our water supply. So we'll keep pumping more and more and more water out of the ground. But the groundwater needs to be recharged by rainfall, just like any other uh, water reservoir. And if we pump the groundwater out faster than it can be replaced, this is kind of a theme in this class, right? Removing something from the environment faster than it can be replaced, that will be unsustainable. And it removes all of the water from the ground. And th th something you might not expect, water is what we call an incompressible material. Uh, that's why it's used in hydraulic systems in, uh, for large construction equipment, right? We, we use the flow of water in order to operate those things, hydraulics. Well, that water is taking up space in the ground, and having an incompressible material making up a large portion of the ground, there's actually a lot of support that the water is creating. It seems counterintuitive, right? Because it's a liquid, so you don't think of that as being very supportive, but it's filling in all the pores and cracks and tiny little open spaces that would be in between stone and dirt and all that kind of thing. So the water is actually a good portion of what's holding up the land. And if you pump all of the groundwater out, then there's all these open spaces available in the ground and they will collapse under that weight uh, and you'll get these large sinkholes. So we get what's called land subsidence. And land subsidence, where all of the dirt and, and stone compresses, right, it collapses together, well now there's no longer any open spaces for the water to be able to be recharged. So over pumping water, as a result of water scarcity, can lead to not only giant sinkholes, which can cause, you know, millions of dollars in damage, but also make it impossible to recharge that groundwater again. Uh, it can also draw salt water into aquifers. If you have a freshwater uh, uh, groundwater source that is adjacent to a body of salt water, uh, some of that salt water can infiltrate into the groundwater. Now it usually doesn't because there's plenty of fresh water already in there taking up that space, but over pumping can allow some of that salt water to come in and then you get salt water coming out of your, your water pumps. And that's not good. So uh, here's uh, that sinkhole is a pretty dramatic example. Here's another dramatic example, a little bit different. Take a look at this telephone pole here and you see up the top it says 1925 Below that, it says 1955, and below that, it says 1977. This is where ground level was at each of these dates. You can actually see how far the land has settled down as a result of overpumping water. This is in the San Joaquin Valley in California. 
Uh, so you can see how dramatic land subsidence can be. How bad is it? Well, here is a map of uh, land subsidence in the United States. And you can see that there's almost no area in the United States where there's not at least a little bit of overpumping, a little bit of land subsidence uh, as a result. So it's really important that we conserve our fresh water so we don't exacerbate this problem in addition to other ones that we've mentioned. So we need a way to get water to water parched areas that doesn't involve overpumping the groundwater. And one solution we've come up with are large water transfer uh, projects. Basically, we build an artificial river which takes water from up in the mountains where there's more precipitation, uh, captures that water in a, usually a reservoir, and then allows the water to fall downhill, basically in this concrete lined artificial river, to uh, cities that are downhill uh, and supplement their water supply. So if we have a dam, we can use some of that for hydroelectric energy. So that's a bonus of this kind of system. Uh, and you can actually control how fast the water comes out or uh, fills up the reservoir, which means that you can actually prevent flooding. You, you can have a little bit of control over upstream flooding. Uh, and this increases the irrigation supply. So in a lot of areas, um, Nevada, uh, places like that, this is how they get water to some of those cities because you build a city in a desert, one of your big problems is going to be water. So water transfer projects use dams, pumps, aqueducts uh, to transfer water from water rich to water poor regions. Now I have a video that should give you an idea about how those systems look and how they work. 50 million cars. Water is an energy catch-22 all its own. It takes energy to get water, but we need water to make energy. H2O is used in mining and fracking, to cool reactors, to make steam, to grow crops for biofuels, and to just turn turbines. Power plants alone count for about 3% of total water consumption in the U.S. Only 2.5% of Earth's water is fresh, and even less is accessible in lakes and rivers. Water, water everywhere, and not a drop to turn into a kilowatt hour. Americans use 13% of their energy to clean water and move it from place to place. The largest electrical consumer in thirsty California? The California Aqueduct. Unfortunately, pumping billions of gallons of water over 700 miles from the mountains to Los Angeles is still cheaper than making the ocean drinkable. In Unit 4, we discussed some of the advantages and disadvantages of hydroelectric power, which requires dams. So here, I'll go through it again, but uh, a little bit more specifically. So one of the advantages of dams is that it provides year-round water for crops and irrigation. We create this artificial reservoir, this artificial lake, uh, and then we have a large water supply in an area where maybe we wouldn't have. It would have just all washed downhill. It provides drinking water. The reservoir can actually be used for things like recreation and fishing. Um, Marsh Creek is an artificial reservoir and people are uh, constantly uh, going there for kayaking and swimming and uh, all kinds of things. It can be used to produce cheap electricity. Uh, the countries that use the most renewable energy, the ones where the largest portion of their energy supply comes from renewables, tend to have a lot of hydropower, not uh, solar and wind. Solar and wind are growing industries, but hydropower is uh, one of the cheapest and easiest ways to produce uh, green electricity. And the downstream flooding is reduced because we have control over when the water is released and when it uh, is collected. So if you have a big storm event, you can allow it to fill up the reservoir and then slowly let it trickle back downhill. However, uh, it floods land destroys forests and croplands and displaces people. We've just taken a large section of land that was used for other purposes and we've converted it over to a lake. So yeah, that does do some habitat destruction. We do actually lose a lot of water through evaporation. However, we've captured it uh, and prevented it from flowing downstream, which may have eventually led to an ocean, so maybe that's a wash. Downstream cropland and estuaries are deprived of nutrient-rich silt. Remember, one of the problems with hydroelectric dams is that they collect sediment behind them, and that sediment can put a lot of pressure and eventually uh, damage the dam itself, but it also means that those nutrients from floodplains uphill are not being delivered downstream to ecosystems. There is a risk of failure and devastating downstream flooding. 
So the dam can fail, it can crack, it can break, and then all of this water would flow out at once. That is a risk. Now in order to prevent that, what we do is we dredge the sediments from behind the dams in order to decrease the pressure, and we do regular dam maintenance. However, those things are both very expensive and we do not do it nearly as much as we absolutely should be doing it. So the risk of uh, dams collapsing and flooding downstream areas, it's a real and present concern because we do not have the resources dedicated to make sure that they don't. Uh, and also it disrupts migration and spawning of some fish. Now we have some solutions for that. I showed you the salmon cannon. I think I talked about fish ladders uh, where they can kind of hop their way up. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily solve it for every species of fish, so that definitely is a concern. On a previous slide, I mentioned irrigation efficiency. So there are some, uh, some fixes that we can use to make crops irrigated uh, more easily. So here you can see on the left we have an image of all of the evaporation happening. We spray all the water on top of the leaves and all over the place, and most of that water just evaporates away. Uh, one possibility uh, on the right here, the one in the center, uh, where you see these fruit orchard trees, we have pipes, hoses, running through the fruit orchards with these rings around the roots, and they slowly leak water, very, very gradually leak water, and that's called drip irrigation. Uh, and that's a great deal more efficient than our usual irrigation method of just kind of spraying over the top. There are some other options here, central pivot irrigation, where we have a pipe in the center of our crops on a fixed axis, and then there's a wheel uh, around the outside, and it goes around in a circle directly spraying down on the crops. Now, it's hard to see maybe why this would be more efficient than our normal irrigation system. Uh, the reason is that we, we basically spray the water uh, directly up in the air, uh, and then it kind of, through gravity, falls back down. And you've seen those, those irrigation systems. It goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, the problem with that is it creates an uneven spray of water. Uh, so you need to use a lot of water to make sure that the uh, plants that are at the far ends of where it's spraying are getting enough uh, irrigation to actually survive. The central pivot evenly distributes the water all over the place so you can actually get away with using less overall water. And the gravity flow system basically means crafting the terrain around your farm in such a way that you could uh, supply water uh, uphill and then it kind of flows like a natural uh, stream back and forth throughout the crops uh, and that can actually increase a lot of uh, the efficiency of farmland. So switching to modern irrigation methods, depending on which one is most appropriate for the kind of crops we're growing, so drip irrigation, central pivot, gravity flow, may help reduce irrigation water usage by 10%. Remember, agriculture is 70% of all of the fresh water that we use, so in total that would be decreasing water usage by 7%, which is almost the amount of water that's used by residences, right? Remember that was 10%, so that, that's a lot of water saved. Uh, actually through these systems. However, there is a lack of incentive in some places to implement these systems because water is uh, cheaper than it probably should be, and we don't have a lot of subsidies, government subsidies, uh, tax breaks, things like that, for implementing uh, these kind of water efficient uh, technologies. So with that, I'll bring the first video to a close. We have talked about water scarcity, why water is scarce, how it's more scarce in some areas than others, and some of the possible solutions for fixing that water scarcity.